Hello. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Lisa Giacomo, and um, I have to agree with everything that Sharon said. Next, um, with everything that Sharon said, while I ended up with in multinational and national or corporate organizations, I actually got my start teaching children and adults in after-school or community settings. Um, but once I made the jump to corporate workplaces, I had to learn a lot of new skill sets. Um, and one of those skill sets was project management. So what I'm going to present today is really targeted towards those who will work in corporate or higher education context and possibly maybe K-12 if you can find bits and pieces that make sense for your practice. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So I thought I should give some background just in case some people are brand new to the concept of project management. My program when I did ID didn't offer a course on this stuff. Um, so I learned it on the job, but once I got to the job, I realized I actually got trained in a lot of these principles and skills during my coursework. It just wasn't necessarily specifically stated as such. So I'm gonna gloss over this first part of information because you can probably find it on a lot of it on your own. Um, and if you're curious about this, you could check out the open and freely available ebook, Project Management for Instructional Designers. It's a great place to get started reading. And mostly I'm gonna focus about what I learned through my own experience in instructional designer roles. Next slide, please. So first of all, projects are generally considered temporary. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end to projects, and they result in either a product or a service. Next slide, please. The project management, next slide, please. And do we have that? Yes, we do. Oh, for, sorry, back one slide. Project management uses various technologies uh, to create improved efficiencies and effective teams. And they, project managers do that by creating a team that is pretty goal focused and dedicated to the success of the project. Um, project team members don't always report directly to the project manager and the success of the project might not affect their reputations or careers in the same way that other job responsibilities would, would. And I found this to be true of my work as an ID, especially when you're talking about working with a SME or an audio technician or a software developer. You know, I had to use a lot of influencing uh, as opposed to any direct authority or direct reports. I just didn't have access to that kind of a organizational structure in my role. Next slide, please. So project managers apply um, project management tools and techniques to clearly define project goals. They plan to meet those goals. They come up with plans to meet them. They um, identify milestones and an end date. So success is connected directly to achieving the project goals within a project timeline and budget, as our previous speakers mentioned. So the PM has to create clear goals and expectations amongst everybody on the team to tie success to the success of the organization. So you have to think at a bigger scale than just your project in order to incentivize and motivate the people that are on your team. I wonder, does anyone think that sounds familiar? Right? That's the same thing that we have to do as IDs. So that's why it's important to get a handle on this basic information. Next slide, please. A project manager and their team may or may not be officially part of an organization. They could be external consultants or they could be internal. Um, if are, the project manager and team are usually direct reports to others in the organization, as I said. So the leaders of this type of a setup must use a lot of interpersonal skills, as our other speakers mentioned, and influencing to get anything done. So technologies like Monday.com or MS Teams or Trello or Smartsheets can help with your organization of your project, but you and you can make but you can make use make the best use of the technology and still not be able to achieve anything because organizational incentives, resources, and the amount of autonomy needed or human relationships, individ and individuals' motivations um, all contribute to the success or failure of a project. So then, why is it helpful to learn about this stuff, right? Well, I found that. I was often the project manager of projects that I was assigned to as an ID. If I used the PM lens to communicate to my business partners, they tended to respond with better support for my work and my asks because it's grounded in common business practices, right? 
Uh, and if I wasn't the PM, then there was a PM and it would help to understand how things were gonna play out in the project. So on the slide, you'll see some common functions that are required to stand up in a project, but I'm gonna skip over that for today and go to the next slide, please. So as others um, in our, that spoke before me have mentioned, you're basically gonna need to develop competencies in three main areas. And these are gonna include technical expertise, um, interpersonal skills and administrative skills. And I'm not really gonna read off everything on the slide. So if you wanna take a screenshot, now's a good time. And I can make these slides available later. But instead we're gonna go to the next slide. And I just want to show you that the project management phases that people like to talk about are generally more or less what you see on this slide. So there's an initiation phase where there's kickoffs and you have to identify the resources that you need and probably create a high level plan. You might come up with a vague budget. Um, that phase, but things become clear as you go on to the planning phase and actually if you talk to the, the PMBOK people, they'll tell you that the planning phase actually goes throughout the whole project. But this is where you really start to dig into the parameters. So what is going to be part of the project, what's gonna be accomplished by the end of the project, the scope, the schedule, the milestones, dates, cost estimates get a little bit more clear. You decide if you need to procure anything. Sometimes you buy something from a vendor like an off the shelf product. Or sometimes you hire talent or expertise and consultants to come in and do maybe a voiceover or something like that. And you think about risk management. So what, what could go wrong, how likely it is, and what you might do to reduce um, that risk. And then there's the execution phase. That's the bulk of the work. Um, so for us, that might be a needs assessment, um, project activities, it might be design activities, development activities, evaluation activities, things like that. And then there's a brief closeout phase um, where all the reports are delivered and documents are archived. And if you're lucky, there's an after action review like the previous speakers have said. And if you're super lucky, you get to celebrate. <laughs> so next slide, please. And what I wanted to tell you, why I wanted to tell you this is because you're already getting trained to do at least two of these phases. You're getting trained to do the initiation and the execution phases for sure. Um, and then you may also be getting trained for the um, planning and the closeout phases. And if you're not, you're probably gonna have to do them eventually anyway. So it's good to dig into that and read up a little bit. So here's what I thought was, this was what was unexpected for me. In the next slide, please. I didn't realize necessarily how much work I was gonna to have to put into making sure that I was clarifying client expectations throughout the whole project from start to finish. And these expectations can evolve, right? With new information, people make different decisions. So you have to be willing and able to constantly engage in conversations to manage these expectations, clarify the values of the client and each team member. So you need to look for the similarities and the differences, and then you need to make sure that you're getting everybody on the same page with the same values at some point, somehow. That's where um, conflict usually arises is when people have different values like this me is valuing and being incentivized to do one thing when you need them to do maybe some more things on your project, right? And so you have to figure out how to rectify that situation. <clears throat> You're also gonna have to spend a lot of time on developing standards and procedures for dealing with problems. So eventually you'll have your own kind of rhythm on how you address those things, but whatever you do, I also learned it's important to do that as soon as possible, not to let those things rest. And people really appreciate that too, especially your managers higher up in the organization or the people that are watching you work. When they see you ready to grab the bull by the horns and just figure something out with whoever needs to be at the table, they will respect that and value that, that kind of leadership. You're gonna to have to constantly revisit past decisions because as we said before, right, new relevant information constantly becomes available throughout the cycle of a project. And that's where I think a lot of the iteration comes in, right? Somebody asked a little bit earlier about, well, how does this allow for iteration? There's a ton of iteration um, in project management and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of finessing of the schedule and the budget. New things come up that weren't anticipated and oftentimes you can kind of work those things in by making concessions in other areas or, or making different paths forward than what you had originally planned. 
you're going to have to spend a lot of time negotiating and resolving conflicts. Um, but hopefully most of your time is really spent on developing trust with others by continuously clarifying goals for everyone, managing your meetings, and monitoring and reporting progress to everybody. People like to know that what they're doing is making a difference and well received. And you're going to have to be the leader for that uh, strong shared vision. So constantly communicate why we're doing this, what we're, what it's going to help the organization achieve, and how important their work is on that team. Next slide, please. And so looking back, my advice, based on my own experience anyways, and so you'll have to take that with my context and a grain of salt, I really think you're going to get the technical ID, change management, evaluation, needs assessment, learning experience, user experience, authoring tool knowledge that you need from your university coursework or webinars or training courses and conferences. Um, you'll need to learn more as you go, but you'll have enough to get you started on the job, either before you graduate or immediately upon graduation. But then from practicums, internships, and even course project work, you will learn to develop some administrative skills too. So you're going to watch how your instructors organize the projects, what they ask you to do, when they ask you to do it, how they ask you to do it, and report out. You're also going to grow these skills when you start to take on small contracts or even full-time employment. You'll watch how the organization typically handles the project, organization of templates, documents, timelines, just general information management, and soon you'll have your own hybridized preferences and approaches for administrative needs and practices. And you may get experience actually developing some of the interpersonal skills, but I think this is where you're going to have to probably focus the most effort, at least I did anyways. Especially if you are able to work in virtual teams during your master's program or in training development situations um, or complete group projects in your coursework, those are, are pretty similar because no one officially reports to you in those group projects or those virtual team projects. But you, and you may have to work with a real client. However, I think you'll probably need to seek out more opportunities in this category out of any of the three categories to develop many different types of relationships with other people to improve your interpersonal skills. And some of these will come from being in graduate school, but most of it will become from talking with mentors, supervisors, coworkers, network with colleagues, and seeking out new communication approaches and tactics. Um, so anytime you run into like a challenge with another person or how to broaden, broach a conversation, a difficult conversation, or get something done that's not started or that's stalled out, um, that is an opportunity to seek out advice, to seek out stories from others who work through similar situations and try some new language, um, some new communication approaches, maybe some new management sales even, or negotiation strategies out. So that's all I have for today. Next slide, please. Thank you.